Listening Dog Media. Okay, round two. Name something that's not boring. A laundry? Ooh, a book club. Computer solitaire, huh? Ah, oh, sorry. We were looking for Chumba Casino. That's right. Chumbacasino.com has over a hundred casino-style games. Join today and play for free for your chance to redeem some serious prizes. Chumbacasino.com. No purchase necessary. Void were prohibited by law. Eighteen plus. Terms and conditions apply. See website for details. He's one of England's most capped international players. Seaman is the man here. He's one of the world's most decorated goalkeepers. And it's somehow kept out by Seaman. That is a fantastic save. This is Seaman Says with David Seaman. And Seaman, what a magnificent save. Hear him. Breathtaking. Like never before. Hello and welcome back to Seaman Says. And the first thing I want to say is defences weren't on top this weekend. There was four games. There was 19 goals. And it's like, come on, what is happening? What, um, where, where shall we start? <sighs> Arsenal? I thought that was quite an easy win. Mm. Well, easier than we thought yeah. when we were doing our predictions. Um, curious, isn't it, that when you've only got four games and you're thinking, what are the match of the day people going to do? Like, they're going to have to do the longest analysis known to man yeah. to make a programme. <laughs> so, that, yeah. yeah, they must have been rubbing their hands together thinking, yes, we've got all these goals we can talk about. Um, yeah, Arsenal, I think I had that down as a 1-0. So I was way off with the prediction. Yeah. Five. I mean, Palace... Palace didn't look good and Arsenal looked very good and you you brought those two together and, yeah, I suppose that explains the five-goal yeah. margin. And I must, but- I must admit, Lindsay, I felt that the, the scoreline flattered Arsenal a little bit. I don't think they were they were that dominant. You know, the last two goals from Martinelli, Martinelli yeah. were just like the cherry on top. But it wasn't you – know, it's, it's a great result. It's a good performance. But, it, you know, I don't know. I just didn't feel like a 5-0. Mm. You know, if you know what I mean, but it was a yeah. We'll take that all day long, if I'm honest. But um, yeah, it was uh, two teams totally different. I felt really sorry for Roy, if I'm honest, because there was a camera, there was a camera angle behind him, weren't there, where the fal- the Palace fans were demonstrating with their banners and that, and then you know you saw Roy look, looking over to it, and I was thinking, oh, like, what what is going through his mind when he sees that? Mm, and chanting, and I, I I was listening to a, a podcast from a palace perspective and i think the general consensus is that they accept that there isn't going to be any change until the end of the season and i don't know whether there's any point unless palace got dragged into a real relegation battle i don't see the point because no. roy as we've seen before does tend to steady the ship i think they've got like a lot of teams they've got players missing but teams of that size usually feel it more because they don't have the replacements to come in um and I, I'm not excusing Roy because I think it probably is time for a fresh, fresh approach, fresh eyes. But the last few times they've tried it, it's just not ended up working. I mean, Vieira did to begin with, and then that went off the boil. You can go as far back as when they brought in um, Frank de Boer. I mean, that was one of the yeah. shortest lived. <laughs> wow. Trying to play yeah. a different style. Do you remember? Uh, um, yeah. I think he yeah, got seven games long. or five games. No. And so they can't, what I'm saying is they can't really tear up the rule book in terms of the philosophy they've had for years and years and years and do that partway through a season, I think that would be really damaging for for the club. So they need to wait until the end of the season and have a summer reset, I think. If they want to try something different, they need to have a really good pre-season. Yeah, they, they need to be careful of what they're wishing for, you know, because mm. they're, where are they now? They're, what, the 15th place. You know, so they're not, like, out of it. You know, so they they need to be they need to be careful. You know, and let all them demonstrate that that I've, you know, I've said we've said it haven't we on here before that it does nothing for the players. That you know, it's demoralizing, no. and it doesn't do any any good for the for the team. Okay, you know, they're on the back of a, a five 0 hiding, but yeah, I just think that they need to be very careful of what they're wishing for. You know, because where do they really expect to go? You know, like, are they are they like trying to thinking? Are they thinking the fans? I mean, are they thinking of like, oh, we'll get somebody else in and we'll start pushing like for Europe and all that sort of thing, which is for me is unrealistic for Palace. It is unrealistic because with the players that they've got, Roy most of the time gets the most out of them. 
with the structure and the yeah. organization that he that he implements he does get the most out of them because they've lost a lot of talent um over the years i I mean, Zahar, as soon as he was going to go, I think they were always going to have an after effect of that. And not many people have spoken about about that. Um, but I, I yeah. honestly think that's huge, huge boots to fill. I mean, it wasn't it wasn't just his goals um, and his creativity. I think it was his just presence around the training ground, the younger guys coming through, seeing what Zahar had done at the club. They've lost that as well. And yeah. with injuries... Um, I just don't think that they've got a strong enough squad. If you if you took it down on paper, they probably have the fifth, you know, take Michael Elise and Eze away and you've got the fourth, fifth worst side in the league, wouldn't you say? Mm. Well, you've got to worry yeah, about that summer awesome. rebuild as well. I guess if you have got a new manager coming in next season and you've got to keep, those, those are the two top, top players in that squad and they've already been linked with moves away. Uh, as he's mm. been, I think, was linked with uh, Manchester United. Um, so if you take those away and a new manager that doesn't kick off properly mm. next season, they could be in in, uh, in trouble. Yeah, And some careful. of the protests are towards Steve Parrish, I think. The fact that they don't spend, they don't have yeah. that backup on the bench. They don't have many, many ways of... of changing their game plan because they haven't got the personnel to be able to do it and and actually sitting down last week I spoke to Nuno um, at Forest and we will come on to a bit more of that later but he was saying about how he's after two at least more versatile players that those are the people that he wants in his team versatility is something that I don't think Crystal Palace have very much of in within the playing personnel I don't think they have many players that play multiple positions um, mm. And I think if you've got a smaller squad or if you've got a smaller budget, you've got to have versatility. So they, they'd be good to start looking in this window, maybe at bringing a couple of those in. Um, but yeah, maybe m- part of this protest is towards the owner as much as it is towards Roy being manager. Yeah, it was just that shot, that camera angle that they had on TV. And I was just like, I just, I felt for Roy. I really yeah. did. I was like, no, it's harsh, you know. And he's done this for such a long time. You know, that isn't the, those aren't the parting shots. You know, you, you think about how at the end of last season, he's going around waving, having adoration from every single set of fans. Those yeah. are the scenes that you want to remember as you bow out of a career, not not those scenes. Yeah, yeah. But it happens, you know, look what happened with Arsene Wenger, you know, the way that he was treated towards mm. the end of his reign at Arsenal. Mm. You know, that really turned horrible and toxic. You know, so, you know, hopefully it doesn't get that far, you know, maybe, and hopefully it, it is mostly vented at the board. Um, but, you know, it just, yeah, I, was, I just, like I said, I just felt really sorry for him. Hmm. What about Liverpool? They looked dominant, didn't they? They did. A, yeah. You got your first, first goal scorer, correct? I know. In this <laughs> <know>. match? <laughs> yeah. Do you know what was funny well, as well, Lindsay? Is because obviously, like Lee, by the way, Lee's had his operation and he's doing really well. Oh, he's been good. very well looked after by me and Frankie. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> he's on the set and he's clicking his fingers and all sorts. Got a bell. <laughs> <Yeah>. <laughs> no, the bell might make his eyes water if I... <laughs> 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 but we've, we've been like we were watching a lot of the football and um, so like we were watching the game and then I was watching what was the other game no no it was Liverpool because at, at one stage at, like I got the, the first goal scorer and then I got the 2-0 wasn't I mm. it, was, it went to 2-0 and that was my prediction and I was like whoa I'm going to get a load of points here and I was chatting to him and then they, and then Liverpool scored three I was like oh no and then I looked at your <laughs> prediction I was like oh no Lindsay's got 3-1 and then <laughs> And then, they, and, then, <laughs> and then they brought her forward and I was like, no, don't let him score. <laughs> and was like looking at me like, really? <laughs> it means that much? I'm like, yeah. <laughs> and, then, and, then, and then obviously went to four and I was like, yes, Lindsay can't get it now. <laughs> <laughs> so it's still very competitive in our house, especially when those two get together. <laughs> well, you mean to say to me when our Arsenal scored five, and I was like, "Come on, Ben White, come on!" <laughs> oh, yeah. Yeah, exactly. <laughs> but I did yeah. say it was going to be someone unusual, and Gabrielle got two. Just coming back to Arsenal for a second, yeah. so there you go. I said I, I don't think it's going to be your out and out goal scorers that are going to score in that match. 
Um, yeah. And then Gabrielle went and is, got two. So is he anyone else's FPL team? Because he's in mine. Oh, is he in yours, Adam? Oh, is he? Uh, no. Big points. Wow. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> I've got no, Saliba, they, they the really other one. Dominant. Yeah. They looked mm. proper dominant, didn't they? You yeah. know, that was a that was a good display. Um, yeah, and I think with Liverpool, without Mo Salah. Um, <clears throat> I think it gives other players an opportunity. I, I don't know about you, but I thought Jota looked a lot more relaxed. Yeah. It's as if he yeah, knows yeah. he's going to get this game time. Yeah. And we, when we were watching it, you know, and, he, and he, his first goal, and oh. I was like, he can finish him. And he, yeah. he, he just, just that first goal, the way that he actually finished it was brilliant. You know, he mm. came to him quick, set it up. And then, and then this, what was it, his second goal? Did he set himself up? Yeah, he was like, he got the assist <laughs> and the an assist? goal. <laughs> <laughs> a little swipe and missed and then set it up and then bang. But yeah, mm. he's, a, he's a proper finisher. And, um, you know, that's the difference that Liverpool have got. They've got people like that coming off the bench that then influence the team. Yeah, the so, so, so um, things like AFCON. And we don't know the extent, do we, of the Mo Salah injury yet? I don't know no, whether afterwards whether Klopp gave any more of an, an indicator. But oh, yeah. I, that, that would be terrible if it is. It's sounding like hamstring, isn't it? <laughs> Yeah, well, it, it did look like that, didn't he? The way that he was holding his his leg, and you know, it was, you know, what was interesting that I found was that you know, like Liverpool were actually going to send out their medical team out to check him over as well. You know, mm. so if they do, it must be it must be serious. Yeah, but um, yeah, but like I said, they, you look at their bench, and they've got they've got quality coming off their bench, so they're looking really strong. And it's what five points ahead now, but City have got a game in hand. Yeah. Yeah, so, but you know, like you still you look at City and you still think, yeah, they're gonna they're gonna start changing into second gear soon. <laughs> <laughs> I think they already they got to second do. last last time, oh, no. and then they yeah, might be going exactly. into third next. Yeah. Mm. And what about Ivan Tony's? Oh wow, what a return! Restart. It was great to see him back, and and like being back and still being cheeky. The free kick. You know, I know this divides divides oh. opinion. You know, as to but for me, it's clever. You know, he's not he's he's just moved it a little bit. You know that that is down for, to the goalkeeper to realign his wall. You know, you've got to keep your eye on the ball all the time. You know, and because he's moved it, it's not like trying to get it closer. He's just moved it to the side a bit. You know, it's down it's down to the get, get know, the bend yeah, for the Forest players to notice it. Like, even the, the guy on the end of the wall was pointing, you know, saying, you know, watch out, you can bend it down the side of me. And then um, Turner, he had a look, but then he didn't he didn't readjust it after he moved it to the side. And then he just slotted it in. But then the, what, the other thing as well was the guy on the end of the wall made the wall smaller, <laughs> if that's possible because <laughs> instead of going towards the ball he went away from the ball he went into the wall and made it smaller mm. and it was an easy an easy pass down the side you know but I, I thought it was a, a very clever goal and um, yeah well well done you know mm. it was funny because I thought I got him as my first goal scorer as well I forgot that Forrest had already scored <laughs> <laughs> Did he look at you again? Why are you cheering again? <laughs> like, yeah. oh, no. <laughs> oh no, he put me right straight away, he did he? Went, uh, I think you'll find Forest have scored. I was like, oh yeah. <laughs> I do think though, with all with all the hullabaloo around that game, with Tony returning, what that did for the atmosphere, I still think Forest look good. I do think Forest yeah. look better under Nuno. Um apart from that kit. Yeah, yeah, the kit's a bit scary, yeah. isn't it? <laughs> yeah. Yeah. yeah, but they, they do. They look they look a lot better. They look they look more of a threat, don't they? Mm. They do look yeah. they do look more threatening. And I think part of what he was talking to me about last week was the fact that yes, they've been scoring goals and they haven't had any problem doing that. But that actually conceding goals is a big issue as well. It was a, a good a good result for the for the crowd. Let's say. Mm. And I think uh, Brentford were very happy the, the way the way that that finished up. Now, what are you thinking, Chef United? The penalty decision. Oh, I was going to say to you about this with Fabianski. So what what did you think? Well, it was Ariola, wasn't it? It was Ariola that gave the penalty away. But then Fabianski was but subbed. Then Fabianski. Yes. Yeah, so, like, so from what I saw, 
Is it because he was injured or did they, they bring him on because he's supposedly good at penalties? But they've never done that with Fabianski before. I've never, I've never ever had that thought of, oh, Fabianski, brilliant penalty saver. I mean, he's, he's saved some over the years, but I've never thought, oh, he's a specialist. Yeah. I know. And then I <laughs> saw I him, wrong? I saw his <laughs> attempt. No, you're not wrong because I saw his attempt at saving the penalty and he bloody <laughs> waited for the ball. Excuse my French. <laughs> <laughs> He didn't even like go one way or the other. He just like, he, he wait unless he thought he was going to go down the middle a little bit. But mm. when I watched it, I was thinking, I can't remember Fabianski being good at penalties, even at Arsenal. <laughs> you know, and, and then, so then Certainly I was not, thinking, the, I wouldn't right, so use the word specialist for him. He's no, not a penalty you know, specialist. I thought, well, you don't think, oh, we're going to go to penalties in a game. I know, we'll bring on Fabianski. <laughs> I think if he's on and he's in his rhythm, then you keep him on. But I didn't yeah. understand the bringing him on. But there were a couple of decisions. And you, you speaking about earlier the the disgruntled fans um, with Palace and Roy, but there was disgruntled fans from West Ham towards Moyes and his his. Yes, subs. that's right. Mm. Yeah, they took he took one. Uh, I can't remember where it was, but he brought a full back on, didn't he? And took us Ben Johnson, yeah, or a striker didn't like that, off. But yeah. I think that and was were, explained were, like, later on. Singing, yeah, you don't know what you're doing. I, I thought that yeah. was they were shouting out at the ref, and then I realised it was at, at David Moyes. You know, so yeah, there's a, there's a lot, a lot of happy, unhappy fans out there. But the penalty decision is interesting because, like I saw on Match of the Day two, and they were saying that it it, it wasn't a they didn't think it was a foul. Yeah, you know, so the so Ariola came out and clattered into McBurney, but then Ariola also got a, an elbow in the face, but. When I saw it, I was like, well, this could be given as a penalty because, because simply because he didn't get the ball, Ariola, when he came out. You know, mm. the referee straight away pointed to the spot. So then that's that's tough. And then obviously, it, I think it went, did it go to VAR and they just said, yep, go with the decision. Mm. I think the fact that he didn't get the ball when he came out with his punch made it an easier decision for the referee. So if he had got the ball, then he might have been okay. If he got the ball and then whacked into McBurney, then you know that's that's fair enough. You know, and if you if you turn it round, if you see like a a defender going straight into a forward who doesn't head the ball, it's going to be a penalty, isn't it? Mm. You know, so you know they're saying that they're treating goalkeepers and defenders the same when they come out of their box. You know, their six yard box, and that you know we spoke about that last week and. You know, so yeah, when you when you come out like that, you you've got to make sure you get the ball. You just can't go in clattering to people nowadays, you know, because they they're giving penalties away. And how about the Boeing one as well? Because I know yeah. they showed that he had two hands on him, but I I don't know. I thought he was already on the way down as well. Yeah, I I'd, I couldn't decide whether it was or wasn't. Mm. If you know what I mean, you know, because they, they both had hold of each other at some stage. You know, and the fact that the Sheffield United defender like was he, he watched the ball a little bit when it was coming in and then just totally left it and was like, Where is Boeing? and was like just grabbing him. You know, so I I wouldn't have been surprised if it if it was given. Mm. But then I wasn't surprised either that it wasn't given. Do you know what I mean? It was yeah, I thought it was fifty fifty. Do you have but any do you have any hope for Sheffield United? I think they needed a win from from that. Yeah, they're saying that the the lowest point score that someone's got, I think it was West Brom. They had twelve points and they got away. I think it was they Wigan got out of the relegation. Wigan was it? Yeah. Was it Wigan? Was it Wigan or Bolton? One of those two. Oh, I had West, West yeah, Brom. West did Brom did have a low points yeah. tally. There's what uh, you know. Mm. So they're what ten points, and that's. I don't know. Mm. I th- there's there's something building though. You know, you can. They, you know, they're not as. As much of a, a walkover as what they were. A paper house. So. <laughs> <laughs> a paper house. <laughs> a chocolate fire guard. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> I don't know why. Paper house came to mind because we've all lived through the storm yeah. from last night. But yeah. Exactly. Oh, I like that, Lindsay. <laughs> <laughs> that was blowing a holy by yeah. the way, last night. Yeah. yeah. <laughs> but um, yeah, so... Yeah, I, yeah, I don't. There, there is something happening. You know, they are getting more confident, but I still quality think that they're, wise, they're they don't. They don't too, have enough quality. Yeah. I mean, he will no. get them to be a surer defence. I think he will get them to be um, sturdier. 
But yeah. I don't think that's going to be enough because you do need creative flair. Because once you've got all of those things in place, you might get draws, but what you don't yeah. get is many opportunities in front of goal. So you need those individuals. Yeah. You need that bit of creative talent. And I just don't think they've got enough. I mean, Cameron yeah. Archer, he scored that lovely goal against Wolves, actually. But it's hit and miss with him. I think sometimes he he looks like he's on it. Sometimes he's it's the consistency. So um, Yeah. I'm looking at the bottom three now, and it's Sheffield United on 10, Burnley on 12, mm. and then Luton on 16, Everton on 17, Forest, and then Palace. But um, yeah, I'd, you, you, you're struggling, aren't you, to, to put any money on Sheffield United, if I'm honest? Yeah. <laughs> I mean, if you want to go there in your predictions, by all means, I could do with some points. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. <laughs> With Lucky Land slots, you can get lucky just about anywhere. Dearly beloved, we are gathered here today to... Has anyone seen the bride and groom? Sorry, sorry, we're here. We were getting lucky in the limo and we lost track of time. <gasps> no, Lucky Land Casino, with cash prizes that add up quicker than a guest registry. In that case, I pronounce you lucky. Play for free at LuckyLandSlots.com. Daily bonuses are waiting. No purchase necessary. Void were prohibited by law. 18 plus. Terms and conditions apply. See website for details. This is Seaman Says. Last week, the Premier League hit Nottingham Forest and Everton with charges around profit and sustainability. To give us the thoughts of Everton fans and their second charge of the season, we're joined by John Blaine from the Toffee TV podcast. How, how are you feeling? Because as an Everton fan, it must be it must be tough times at the moment. Yeah, I mean, it, it was tough times back in November when uh, the Premier League decided to steal 10 points off us, which wasn't very helpful. And um, we'd started the season really badly. And actually, we're, we're having a bit of a bad patch at the moment with, what is it, one point from the last four games. But in between, we were motoring, really. Um, you know, top top certainly top four, five yeah. performance in getting points and the like. And we just need to uh, steady the ship again and uh, and close the season out and, and stay in this league for next year. Yeah, because we, we were talking about when when you first got the deduction, you know, the, the form that you were in then, when it actually happened, we were like, yeah, but Everton will be fine because they're playing, they're playing really well, you know, and then you got yourselves right out of it. And like you say, I'm just looking at the league now and it's, yeah, you, it's the, the form's dipped a bit, hasn't it? Yeah, it has. Um, I mean, immediately the points were deducted. We lost at home to Manchester United from a worldie in the first two minutes, which didn't help us at all. Um, but but after that, we won four on the bounce and uh, and, and we're doing okay <laughs> until and, until we decided to not turn up at Wolves. And uh, and then we've had a bit... Well, we had to play Man City as well, but most clubs lose to them. Um, but yeah, I mean, we just need to get, get, get back on the straight and narrow. I think that the team and the squad and the way Deitch is managing them um, I, I think we, unless they give twenty odd point deduction, I, I think we're probably going to survive in this division. Yeah. So, h- how about John this this extra charge? Because there's Everton and Nottingham Forest that have admitted to some more breaches. What do you think that's going to look like? Because it could be as late as April, we're hearing, before you find out what the deduction is. So that uncertainty around the club, at least when you got 10 points, you knew what you were dealing with. And now it feels like there's this uncertainty factor that you've got to add in as well. Yeah, I I mean, the the 10-point thing, I think most Everton fans are expecting that. We've got our appeal as well, of course, before the, 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 the... the judgments or the cases that are taken against Everton and Nottingham Forest for, for the most recent breach. Um, the appeal were hopeful, um, that different set of eyes, the VAR, I suppose, you know, they, they, they keep making different decisions depending on who the referee or who the official happens to be. So we'll have a completely different uh, judge and jury. We've strengthened our legal team. And it, it all comes down to, which is really sad from a, a footballing perspective, but accountants and lawyers are going to decide who gets relegated this season. And and, and that's just madness in my mind. But um, I'm, I'm reasonably optimistic. I, I think the, the net outcome of an appeal and then the subsequent case that's been caught, you know, we've been called out for recently could actually end up with us anywhere between zero pointed 
and and 20 plus deducted and and that's mad that that could run into april and maybe even into may and the season could be over before anybody knows what what the outcome is which just is really an indictment of uh, how poor processes are at the premier league and and how is this different to what's going on at manchester city john um, that, um, well, I guess uh, the first thing that's different is Manchester City seem to get treated rather differently than than everybody else. Um, you know, they have private me- meetings with governments and, and so on. But the reality is that they approach or appear to have approached it from a different perspective, which is they don't seem to recognise the jurisdiction and they haven't provided information. And in the absence of information um, about their accounts and, and some of the... the, the uh, you know the the details of that that the Premier League have asked for, they they're basically getting done for failing to failing to cooperate. Where both Nottingham Forest and Everton have got done for following the process and demonstrating that they've they breached the limit. So cities is far more wide reaching than simply profitability and sustainability rules. It, it's to do with the whole process of how they engage with with this with the you know with the league and the, and the competition managers. Yeah, because that's why they're facing all these multiple charges and that's why it's been pushed further down the line, I suppose. But um, it, it's interesting that that their outcome is just, it could be so much worse then. I think if you're a Manchester City fan and I'm listening to you, I could be thinking, oh, well, if it's because they've not been compliant and then there are breaches, surely that's going to be a, a worse outcome than what it was for Everton? Um, you expect so. Um, I mean, and Chelsea are in a similar situation. They're currently under investigation, having paid their fine for, bre- for, for breaking the rules um, with UEFA. Uh, and yet the Premier League and Richard Masters, um, when he, he faced the select committee last week, he, he said that two things really. One is, all he said about Chelsea was, uh, we're investigating, and what he said about Manchester City was, "We know when their case is going to come to court, per se, but we're not going to tell you when it is." But apparently, that's towards the end of this year, and and with a result next summer. Uh, by which time, of course, the Premier League, who clearly give the impression that they're making the rules up as they go along, uh, will have changed the rules again. So uh, I, I guess the smart money and and Manchester City have rather a lot of it, and a are quite uh, happy to go to court and have multiple KCs arguing with each other. The smart money is that City are not going to be found guilty in, in a manner that causes them concern when a, um, a sanction is applied. Do you realistically think, John, that, that Everton will get deducted twice? Um, absolutely not. No, David, I don't. I think there's a couple of things here. One is natural justice, that you can't be punished for the same thing twice. Uh, clearly, yeah. when the rules were put in place, I don't think the Premier League had ever expected anybody to actually go through or some Forrester going through. Um, and because it's a three-year cycle, of course, the third oldest year has fallen off and the, the next year comes on. So depending on how you choose to do it, two-thirds or three-quarters of the numbers are the same. So we will already potentially have been punished uh, for, for, for one breach. And it seems crazy that we could get punished again for two thirds of the same breach. So I think it all, hence why it gets into mm. lawyers and forensic accountants. Time. And what were the 10 points? Were, were they for multiple breaches? So I'm, I'm trying to get an indication now of what Forrest could be expecting. Oh, well, th- th- there's a single breach, which is failing to, to uh, come within 105 million losses over three years. Everton exceeded the allowable allow you know the limit by nineteen point five million, and that of course was during a period when COVID happened, when the Ukraine war started. They forever lost sponsorship and so on, and the same applies to Nottingham Forest in many respects. They've they they broke the rule once. Yeah, they may have broken it by buying forty or fifty players, but they've only broken the rule once. And yet City allegedly have, have, have got over a hundred. So maybe the, the the trick here is if you're going to fail or breach something, breach it big, make it really, really complicated and watch the can get kicked down the road at every opportunity. It must be so frustrating for the fans and, and the players, actually. I'm just trying to think of like if, if I was playing and this was like hanging over us, you know, you're doing all that you can to get things right on the pitch, yet people off the pitch aren't getting it right, you know, and... Who's who's really to blame? 
Yeah, it, it's crazy, truly crazy, David. And, and and the people most culpable are obviously the leadership within the football club when all this was going on. You may know that there's a fair amount of fan activism went on in the last couple of years at Everton. We drove out some of the people who were the cause of this, most notably the chief executive and the finance director. They've gone, never to be seen again. Um, sadly, Bill passed away, of, of course, who, who was the chair. And it's fair to say they, under the fundamentally the instruction of the largest shareholder, Farhad Mashiri, have, have really got us into this mess. And then that's been compounded by a Premier League from a governor's point of view, who are clearly not fit for purpose. Hence, you know, the emerging uh, likelihood of, a, of an independent regulator. So, yeah, Everton fans, we, we get it. We hands up our ownership, made a mess of it. But now, while we're down, the uh, Premier League is sticking the boot in. So, so it's, it's all a bit painful as a fan. Absolutely, <laughs> yes. Does it worry you that some of your your top players potentially could leave? Because I'm thinking, if you're if you're playing in a team that where there is so much unrest and so much going on behind the scenes, that actually, as a player, you just think. I don't want to be a part of this. I, I, I'm looking for a transfer in the summer. Even if you do stay up, are you worried that actually a lot of your top talent could look elsewhere to go somewhere where it's just a little bit more settled and balanced? I, I think players, all players, and David will know this because he was a very, very good one. Uh, you know, they all have ambitions. You know, eventually at some stage it's set aside, and these guys want to win trophies. They want to have medals. We all know. The, 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 the trope that just gets tripped out by players, I want to play in the Champions League and, and so on. I mean, we've got two truly um, exceptional talents in Amadou Anana and, and Jared Branthwaite. And, and it's fair to say, you know, most fans, in fact, all Everton fans would think it's when they leave, not if they leave. And, and I think it's quite likely that if he has a successful Euro Euros in, in the summertime, Anana will go in this window, uh, this next window, um, and maybe if for no other reason to try and balance the books financially. But I think he has ambitions and his ceiling is quite high. Jared Branthway signed a new contract last year for, about f- for, for five years. But again, it's going to be when he goes, not if he goes. Um, to answer your d- question, the direct part of your question, I don't think either of them are going because of the off-field activities and, and the frustrations that might bring. I think Sean Dyche, bless him, has got this odd pulling together and the, and the teamwork and the and the and the, the spirits and the morale is probably as high as it's been for many a long year. So I, I think they'll go for sporting reasons mm. rather than anything else. And you touched on it there by by saying Sean Dyche, bless him, because I think a lot of people are feeling sympathy for him. He spoke about his time at Burnley and probably being able to write one book and then said in three months of being at Everton, he co- probably could have wrote four or something ridiculous. So. He's had a lot to take on. Is the concern more around him? You know, is he going to stay? Uh, yeah, I think Sean Sean is is going to stay. I mean, he also so when he when he got the job, that big jobs don't come along very often, and you you need to grab the opportunity when you get it. I think um, I'd like to think because I'm an eternal optimist that the worst is behind us. And I think what Sean has gone through, he deserves to see the good times, if you will. And, and, it, and if you ignore the 10 points, where he's currently got the team performing, you know, as a solid mid-table team. And of course, because of the way these regulations work, notwithstanding the Premier League are going to change them again, um, each year are excesses of the past. And, and let's not be shy here. Everton Football Club have lost hundreds of millions of pounds over the last five years six, seven years under the, you know, the direction of Fahad Bashiri. But all the worst excesses were t- three or four years ago. So every year it gets a little bit better. Mm-hmm. And um, if we can keep the squad together sufficiently to build on what he's doing this year, then the, the only way is up, as they say. But no, I, I don't think Sean's got any designs on uh, going anywhere anytime soon other than uh, higher up the division and, and potentially doing something, uh, you know, at it in a cup or something. Plus, you, you've also got the new ground to, to look forward to as well. Ah, wow. That, that is the, uh, <laughs> you know, the, uh, the, the the one thing to hang on to is we will end up uh, ultimately with a with a magnificent stadium on the banks of the Royal Blue Mersey, which is pretty much paid for, mm. you know, and, and you were at Arsenal and Arsene Wenger did great work when you were building your new stadium. But um, 
yeah. th- this all all these issues we have are mismanagement, building a stadium, a worldwide pandemic, a war, all happening at the same time. And of course, Richard Masters and his mates at the Premier League have taken all that into account and they've kicked us while we're down. So well done them. You, you, you've just mentioned about having this amazing stadium that will be paid for. So as much as you're levelling a bit of blame at amongst the the last few years and how it's all it's all been hard and caught up with the club who do you credit with this you know if in a few years time you're looking at it and you you've got your own stadium it's paid for you're in a brilliant position where you can attract more players when the good times come who are you crediting well the the one thing that Farhad Mashiri will be able to look at with some pride is something that's going to be really quite persistent because it's going to sit on the banks of that Roblu Mersey for rather a long time you know when the euros come round in 2028 it's going to host multiple games and so Farhad and I've met Farhad more than once I think he can take some pride on that but it's a classic if he could have his time again, I'm sure he would have done things slightly mm. differently. And we, what should really be happening is we should be going into that stadium as a top six, seven club, recognising that each year we're striving for European competition. Instead, we're, we're kicking around in the doldrums, trying to stay in the division. And a, a nice shiny stadium or, uh, you know, in Liverpool isn't going to help that. But as the finances get better year on year, it will, of course. And of course... Farhad will go. He, you know, he's trying to sell air holding as we speak. And that's something else we're waiting on the Premier League to conclude. Um, we're so far, you know, 12, 16 weeks into a 12-week process to determine whether 777 partners of, uh, of the United States are going to be allowed to take over the club or not. And that, again, gives us great potential if that happens or indeed if it doesn't, because allegedly there are other suitors waiting in the in the shadows hoping that Triple Seven don't get it so that they can. Okay. John, do you think, you know, with all this going on, do you still think that Everton have got enough to stay up? I think so, David, yes. I mean, we debated this on the channel, on Toffee TV, uh, before we actually got the second, uh, you know, referral. And uh, in that yeah. time, we, we had a bit of a roundtable discussion and clu- concluded 15-point deduction or less, and we'd be okay. Uh, it's crazy if, if we can maintain that middle form that I talked about before. We might even survive a 20-point deduction. But I'm actually expecting us to get points back, not add points taken off us. So so I think we'll be okay, my friend. Yeah, I do. Yeah, you know, I, I hope you do, mate, because it's not, there's nothing worse than, like I say, as, as a player, you know, all this going on, you know, you're doing your stuff on the field and then it's just off the field stuff that's really affecting you. And plus, you've also got a pretty decent goalkeeper. <laughs> <laughs> yes, England's no long like you like yourself exactly. for so long. Yeah, yeah, and he's and he is England's number one. There's no doubt about it. You know, he's um, he, when he performs for England, he's when he turns up for England, he's brilliant. Yeah, you know, he's the proper goalie, as they say. He, he's never let England down. He's let us down a okay? cape. Yeah, but he plays more for you, so he's bound to. He gets a lot more to a lot more to do for Everton than he does for England. Yeah. You have to look at it like that as well, John. <laughs> yeah, that, that's a most that's a really good way to describe it. Absolutely, yes, he does. He does. Yeah. Well, brilliant. Thanks for that, John. You're welcome, my friend. Take care and and good luck, mate. And I and I do up. I do hope it doesn't happen again because mm. it would be a shame. Uh, thanks, David. And thanks to you, Lindsay and Adam as well. For all the latest Everton news and views, search for the Toffee TV podcast. Harry Madge of the Week. Right, Lindsay, it's time for our Parry Match of the Week. Um, there's a couple, actually, isn't there? There's, there's the Chef United game. Yeah, I guess an argument can be put forward for a few. I, I always think that a Match of the Week isn't necessarily the one-sided affair. So I'm going to park Arsenal and Liverpool and I'm going to look yeah. I'm going to look at the other two and I think I think Brentford against Forest because it had that added factor of Ivan Tony returning after the ban. Yeah. And I don't know just watching as well you could tell what an impact that had with the crowd. They needed that win. I honestly think if Brentford yeah. had done anything but win that then they suddenly would be pulled right into the relegation. Um, and having a fight on their hands, and I, I don't think that's over by any stretch. But with with Tony, I think they're they're going to be a lot better equipped to get out of what they've yeah. been in. Um, so, but I don't then know. there's the Sheffield United side, yeah. you know. So obviously two 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 sendings off. 
you know, last like, minute penalty. Obviously, last minute penalties, last minute penalties that could or could have been given. <laughs> the sub of the um, goalkeeper. I mean, that was yeah, yeah. The sub. Yeah. So I think, yeah, for me, I, I'm going to go with the Sheffield United game, the Sheffield United West Ham. Well, if anyone was ever wondering who listens to this show, you know what happens in these situations where David and Lindsay don't agree. Uh, David wins. It's his show. So. <laughs> <laughs> That's what happened. He's made about the goal. <laughs> um. <laughs> He's the Shirley Ballard, what, what's, Seaman says, the head judge. <laughs> what's that podcast called, by the way? <laughs> I don't think David's ever been described as Shirley Ballard. <laughs> <laughs> Who's Shirley Ballas? <laughs> Wrong dancing show, Lindsay. He doesn't even know who she is. So you know who Len no. Goodman is. Yeah. So Len yes, Goodman do, used yeah. to have that role, and uh, so effectively, three judges, a little bit like me, Adam Callum, would all have a say, yeah. and then if it was split, so say it was it was going down oh, to the I final vote, yeah, then yeah, yeah. that Decided vote would have vote, the yeah. yeah would have the biggest sway. Oh, we got right. I'm yeah. with you. So, so yeah. we can call with it, Shirley. <laughs> yeah. Oh, yeah, yeah. <laughs> <laughs> Everyone's feeling brave at their own homes. <laughs> <laughs> well, Callum, what, what one would you go for if, if, you were, if there was a deciding vote? And oh, we're no, not taking it away from, from, from David. <laughs> <laughs> go, what, who would you go, go for the, then? Uh, I'd go for the Sheffield United West Ham uh, as well. Just because, I would as well. Just, uh, just there you go. There you go. Yeah. 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 Just, just call me. It, it, it got, just call it, me Anton. <laughs> 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 because it got the sending offs as well, and then the the penalty situations, and yeah. then the goalie coming on, and all that. Yeah, okay. so. more drama. Mm. Yeah, but I'm glad that we've spoken quite a lot about the Parry match game of the weekend because. Coming up next is save of the week, and there isn't one. Oh, how can I have a save of the week when there's four games and there's 19 goals conceded? <laughs> Are you abstaining? <laughs> I, 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 honestly, I've looked through, and I've and I've like I've, I've looked and I saw I think who was it? Ariola made a save, but then straight away the rebound went got knocked got knocked in. Because he parried it out mm. in right into play. Mm. Matty Turner made a decent, a weird looking save off the crossbar. Mm. You know, when it bounced down and then he he, he like he scooped it out. But what you're forgetting though you know, that me- is that we're recording this before Brighton against Wolves. Could be a brilliant yeah. save in that match. All right then. Well, if there is, well, I mean, there could be some save of the week as well. But yeah. I know, yeah. yeah, it's like it's gone from save of the week to no save of the week to delayed save of the week. <laughs> yeah, to prediction <laughs> save of the week. Yeah, <laughs> I am really struck. I can't, I, you know. And I was like, I, well, obviously, me and my mate Dicko were having trying to find out, and they were like, no, there's none of them worthy of being in there because all the saves that were made were just they were saves. Yeah. They weren't. They weren't exceptional. No, and because it's only four games to look at, it was really hard. So we'll give you we'll, we'll give um, you a bye then for that one. Yeah, yeah, that's fine. <laughs> it's None a no save of the week. Seal of approval. Yeah, no save of the week because defense has let nineteen goals in <laughs> four games. Hello, <laughs> <laughs> that's why there was no save of the week. They were letting him in. <laughs> For the latest odds, visit Paramatch UK, 18 plus, visit begambleaware.org. Right, that's it for today's episode. We'll be back here on Friday ahead of the next round of the FA Cup games. So we'll see you all then. And I can't wait for the FA Cup. This is a Listening Dog Media Production. Sports Social Podcast Network. Lucky Land Casino, asking people, what's the weirdest place you've gotten lucky? Lucky? In line at the deli, I guess? Aha, in my dentist's office. More than once, actually. Do I have to say? Yes, you do. In the car, before my kid's PTA meeting. Really? Yes. Excuse me, what's the weirdest place you've gotten lucky? I never win and tell. Well, there you have it. You can get lucky anywhere, playing at LuckyLandSlots.com. Play for free right now. Are you feeling lucky? No purchase necessary. Void where prohibited by law. 18 plus. Terms and conditions apply. See website for details.